Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final virtual College of Liberal Arts faculty colloquium of the fall 22 semester and possibly ever. We're going in, in person here. Uh, my name is Dr. Quentin Maynard. I will be moderating today's talk and the talks next semester. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Professor Chuck Armstrong. Chuck Armstrong is, a, is an assistant professor in the Department of Art and Design here at the University of Southern Indiana. He earned his Bachelor's of Science in Marketing from Indiana University and his Master's of Fine Arts in Graphic Design from Indiana State University. Prior to his employment at USI, Chuck worked in a number of capacities within the graphic design field. Art director, illustrator, sign painter, animator, muralist, studio owner, and freelance consultant. His client list is nearly as diverse as his job titles, ranging from small mom and pop retail establishments to 400, Fortune 500 companies. Chuck believes that the cone is the university's most um, interesting resource and is petitioning whomever one petitions for these types of things for the cone's designation as the eighth architectural wonder of the Western Hemisphere, or at least the west side of Evansville. Professor Armstrong, I'm excited about your, your talk today. The screen and the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Quinn. I also want to, you know, of course, start out with a few other thank yous. Um, the College of Liberal Arts, obviously, for offering me this opportunity, the Laura Committee for granting me the, uh, the research award that this talk is based off of, my own chair for not screaming about the course release when we were down, faculty members, and my art and design colleagues for covering my butt during that time. Um, yeah, so I, I wrote this, um, the grant the uh, and received a Laura to work and, and use graphic design as a way to try to address the issue of gun violence in Evansville. It was a big, audacious, um, and very ambitious project. And I knew that it wasn't anything that could happen over the course of a semester. Um, but I thought, you know, I got to try. And then I I also realized that um, most everybody else has something tangible to show at the end of their, their, their semester of lore. They produce something, they've created some research, um, written something or drawn something. And um, I don't have anything like that. So um, Quentin, is this where we then like go ahead and go to questions? I'm I'm joking. I've sort of debated on how long I would <laughs> let that pause run um, to see if anybody really kind of thought I was serious on that. But um, I, you know, the Laura project really ends, or that semester really ends up being a, a small part of this overall project. And to really sort of explain my research, I, I kind of go need to go back several years before that happened, um, even back to the time, uh, maybe when I was at USI before I left USI and then came back to USI. I've often told my students that graphic designers, and yeah, I firmly believe this, graphic designers shape all of the information that we digest. And if we understood that, if we kind of understood our, our place in that, we as graphic designers have a tremendous amount of power, you would think. You know, if we would just sort of band together, we could change the world, perhaps. Um, and I really became aware of this sort of in you know, maybe maybe 10 years ago. I became aware of of movement within the graphic design industry of design for social good or design for social justice. And as soon as I heard it, I, I'm kind of like, you know, I've done a whole bunch of logos. I've done websites, brochures, catalogs. This is something new. And this was a way that I was sort of invigorated by, by some of what I was hearing there or some of what I was seeing. Um, 
But I was also at that time was very aware of what was happening in our schools. You know, the school shootings had been going on but 10 years ago. They had been going on for, for quite some time. Um, I had some, some personal reasons for becoming more involved with that, some, some things that I was seeing and, and hearing that were kind of frightening. And I, I took those two together that if, if we have all this tremendous power um, and this ability, we shape all the information. Isn't there something that we as designers could be doing that would address this weird problem that nobody seems to know how to address? There's a designer named Lise Clint um, who works for an organization that I cannot pronounce um, where she works. It's in Copenhagen. She is a, a, a product designer and senior project manager for this design firm. And she is also sort of an evangelist for the design for good and design for social justice. And, and she has, she's spoken at a number of conferences and given talks and presentations on this. And a quote from her is, I truly believe that if you have the ability to respond to problems, then you also have the responsibility to do so. I took that to heart. Um, I think that I do have the ability to respond to problems like this, um, gun violence, and that means that I need to. And so that has sort of become my, my windmill, so to speak. Now, 10 years ago, I, though, I had no idea what to do with this. And so the first thing that I did, it was following a mass shooting. I wrote what I felt was a, an articulate, reasonable post on Facebook. And it, it went over about as well as you might imagine. Um, I, it lasted about 24 hours. I took it down, disabled all the contents. And I, I actually, after that, left Facebook altogether for about four months. But I was just amazed at all these people first that were my friends, were my friends for, you know, for, from high school, um, people I had known um, yelling and bickering at each other. It was amazing where what I thought was a well-reasoned statement took off. What I learned from that was that if you're going to talk about gun violence, which is a clearly a problem, and everybody will agree that it is a problem, it is always going to sort of fall back into this Second Amendment polarizing argument and nothing can get done. I realize that the Second Amendment discussion will suck all the air out of the room, will totally take over the argument, and nothing happens, as we've seen for 20 years. Nothing gets done with this. So I had to back up, said, okay, if we're going to solve the problem, um, first thing we have to do is address how we talk about the problem. How can we do this without um, getting everybody upset about the Second Amendment? So I decided I would make some little postcards. And I had a pithy little saying with that um, for the uh, um, for the liberals. I had a blue colored postcard that I would supposedly hand to them and say, treat a conservative to coffee. And there was a little website um, address at the bottom where you could give some talking points. And for the conservatives, I had a red colored card say, buy a liberal a latte and direct them to the same website where they could sort of find out what this, this thing is about, what this program is. Can we just sit down and have a conversation without yelling at each other about the Second Amendment? Yeah, well-intentioned, but really it was kind of stupid. Um, it's a cute idea. It's something like, oh, you know, bless his heart. He's trying, but he's not doing anything with this. Yeah, I, I, I made a website and I printed up these cards and then I had to distribute them. I had to, I, I ended up, you know, that was all kind of embarrassing. I was posting flyers up around town, stealthily going around and 
you know, taping them to walls and leaving leaving my cards like on top of a gas pump or something like that because I will I wasn't good at, at handing them to everybody to anybody at all and so you can imagine that that didn't go anywhere so it was like all right it's it's a concept but it's sort of like me standing outside the building right now and yelling hey everybody stop shooting at each other pat myself on the back and say oh look what I did I did something really wasn't doing much of anything at all um that was a project I actually tried before I came back to uh, USI, at least it was in Terre Haute. So hopefully nobody really saw that and I I don't have to be too embarrassed about that. Um, when I came back though, this was still, I knew this was the subject that I wanted to deal with. And um, that was gonna be where my research back here at USI was, was gonna center around. Um, but again, I didn't know what to do. More thought, I just was reminded maybe of a bumper sticker on the Lloyd Expressway, something that says, think globally, act locally. Okay, how can I do that? Um, you know, school shootings are such a huge problem, but we haven't had any school shootings here in Evansville, but we've been damn lucky. We were really close one time um, and the the um, unfortunate student took his own life before he went into Central High School with loaded guns and took other lives. We were fortunate. We have had kids with guns at our schools. We have had mass shootings here in Evansville. Um, February 17th, 2019, five people were shot outside of a bar here. And for that incident, we made the cover of Time Magazine. And at that time, we were that incident was one of 253 mass shootings through the month of August in 2019. 253. But wait, as of Monday morning, the Gun Violence Archive reports that there have been, with this is after the UVA shooting, um, there have now been 599 mass shootings this year alone. 599. I'll come, come back to the guns. I'm, I'm going to take a bit of a detour here to my process. Um, there's there's a firm called IDEO or IDEO.org, which is a design firm that specializes in using a process that is known as human-centered design. Um, and part of my research about what I'm going to do, I, I started following them. They make a lot of materials free uh, for you to use. And so I've I've accessed a lot of their resources. And I decided that when I came back here, I would start including a section or a unit on human-centered design with my art and design students here at USI. And I did it at first in my intro to graphic design class. Um, human-centered design has like three core beliefs to them. Um, one, every problem, even the largest, uh, most intractable problem, gun violence fits that. Those problems are solvable. And the solutions can be found from within the people or the community that is, or, or the audience that is facing or is dealing with the problem. And the third thing is that those who tackle human-centered design have an overabundance of creative confidence or gravitas or whatever you want to call it. Um, I will admit to not be lacking in that. I think that I can do this. There's, if, if there is maybe a fourth core belief of human-centered design, it is that a failure, uh, you fail often. And if I understood my, um, how, uh, how to toggle back and forth here 
smoothly, you would see a picture of Thomas Edison right now on your screen with a little cartoon bubble that says, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Failure is a big part of human-centered design. Um, you've got to try a lot of stuff. You've got to lot of, throw a lot of spaghetti on the wall until you finally get one that's going to stick. But I introduced the human-centered design concept, of the process, in just a four-week unit with my intro to graphic design classes, really to try to get the students to understand that you can fix just about anything. It's part of, part of the idea of um, you know us designers having so much power. And we would take on these ridiculous projects and try to find a solution to them. The very first one that we took on was the art center. The art center is if you spend much time in this building, there's it it has a problem. Now, is there a way that graphic design students, freshman and sophomore level graphic design students with no money, no architectural training, none of this other stuff. Can we do something about the art center? And in four weeks, hopefully they believe me because I thought they found a solution. Um, a, a later one, the next semester, we took on um, recycling on campus. And again, we, we didn't take any of these things to completion but we did go through the process and we came up with viable concepts that would work. And then we moved on to our next, our, our next intro to graphic design projects. And so the point wasn't actually to make anything, but to show them that we, there is a solution out there and you can find that if you follow this process and follow these principles. And the, the last one I think was just, crazy that this guy raises his hand um, at this point we're in um, in the middle of COVID so the human part the human interaction was a lot more limited than when we started this but um, the problem that we were going to try to solve was how do you find something in a store when you've never been to that store before with without having to walk through the aisles and I thought okay well if there's ever going to be a project that that proves me wrong on this, this is it. But lo and behold, after four weeks, we had a solution. Um, the, the process of human-centered design works. And I, I kind of proved it to myself with that. I was hopefully proving it uh, to the students. Um, and now I had the courage to apply for the LORA. So I, I applied for the Liberal Arts Research Award and got it because you know who's going to turn down um, gun violence we're going to end gun violence yeah we're going to award that um but i quickly found out it's it's one thing to teach this in class and it is uh quite another thing to go out and do this um i did know going in that i knew just enough um, about gun violence, just enough about the project, just enough about the process to know that I really didn't know much at all. So I did know going in that there was going to be a lot of discovery with this. Um, I just didn't necessarily know how much. So the semester came, I had the course release, and I had to start working on this. And, you know, where do I begin? So I, obvious places, gun violence is against the law. So, you know, that, that's a crime. I'll start with the police department. Called the police department up, sent a couple of emails. I did the same with the Vanderburg County Sheriff's Office. Um, nothing, crickets. I never, ever got a response. Now, again, I'm just some guy out of the blue. And maybe as I'm sort of framing this, I can imagine uh, you know, somebody seeing my email and say, hey, uh, look at this guy. This, here's a graphic designer he wants to solve gun violence in Evansville. He's a graphic designer. What's he want to do? He wants to make a logo and make us pay for it? I don't know. Um, so I was a bit naive really going into this, but um, I didn't know any better. I had to find my way. I did know following reading the literature that what I needed to do was assemble a team. We had to have a creative team that would, would do this. And I'm an old white guy. 
and I live out in the burbs. I live out on the north side of uh, Evansville. Um, I looked at the maps. Uh, my house isn't centered in a place where a lot of gun incidents or you know calls for guns fire, shots fired. You know, every once in a while somebody shoots at a rabbit or something, or or maybe a raccoon on their uh, porch. But um, I knew that I needed a diverse group of people around me if I was going to have any legitimacy. And that was something that I needed to do. This isn't just a one person type of project. If we really wanted to make a difference, we had to have a team of people. And so I started calling the people again. Now, you know, I knew better than to call the sheriff's office or the police department, but I went around um, assembling the team and I had a bunch of lunches and coffee with people. And I would just call people out of the blue. I started with some people I knew. I, I, one of the first calls I made was somebody um, that I knew was an avid um, hunter, was someone that I would kind of consider a gun guy, um, but also a good friend. And when we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation, he was all in. And I talked to a number of other old friends that did, and everybody was excited about it, but if I'm just going to assemble this team of old friends, they're going to be people who are a lot like me, so I had to uh, to spread it out. Um, I called our, our uh, fourth ward councilman, Alex Burton. He was excited about this, um, and in talking to a number of different people, they um, sort of led me into some other directions, and Alex, in fact, told me about another initiative that was going on within law enforcement. And he invited me to um, at least zoom into a city council meeting in March of one, this was March of 2021. Um, there was an organization called the National Network of Safe Cities and the city was going to hire this organization to come in and deal with gun violence. Now, their approach is different from what I thought my approach was, but you can't have too many people trying to do good in town, right? Um, I'm, I'm just going to say this without commentary, is the city agreed to pay them $385,000 over three years to address this. Um, I haven't heard a lot about them in the year and a half since the city agreed to do that, but um, I'm sure they're spending the money well and we'll come back with a solution eventually. But I am thinking at the time of this, uh, of the city council meeting that how can I get a seat at this table? I could use a little bit of, of that to work on the project from my end. I learned also in talking with members of the community that there's another organization in town, Congregations Acting for Justice and Empowerment, or CAGE. They were the ones that actually went out and found the NNSC and pestered the city until the city agreed to go along with this. There's some interesting politics here because there are some members of CAGE who felt then that the, they weren't getting the credit due to that. Um, but, but still, I, I called them and um, got some interesting resistance in that phone call. It was almost as if they wanted, or I should say, this isn't speaking about the entire organization. This is speaking about who I spoke to on the phone, that they felt that they had the ownership of the solution and I'm a designer wanting to do this. That's sweet and all, but um, maybe I am just the guy who can make a logo. That's at least the feedback that I kind of got over the phone call. So nothing went on from there, but talking with other people still in the community, I come to Mari. Mari is a mother whose son was shot at his front doorstep when they were shooting at somebody else. He did not die. He has been recovering from the effects of that gunshot for over three years now. He is still recovering. He is almost fully back to being um, 
as as mobile and as um, able to do everything that he was before, but he's still not there. Three years of this. <coughs> Excuse me. Mari started an organization called Mothers Against Senseless Killings, or MASK, of Evansville. And what they do in the heart of where gun violence is going on, the heart of where, where shootings are going on, they, Mari, and other mothers put on pink shirts and walk around the blocks patrolling the neighborhood in the dark by themselves, no guns, no police presence. They walk around, they see somebody stand on a corner, they go up and they talk to him and say, go stand someplace else. Um, there's some audacity, there's some gravitas there. I asked Mari if she would be on my team and of course she said yes. So I had this then diverse rock star team assembled that we were going to now figure out what we're going to do next um, to fight gun violence. So, all right, go us. I didn't really have an agenda beyond that. I didn't know what to do. And I realized now in hindsight, I was hoping that with all of these people that we could start talking about things maybe and that they would be able to show me what we needed to do next. They were saying, hey, here's this old white guy that wants to do this and he's going to tell us what to do. And we're just sort of, yeah, looking at each other and nothing got done and um, the semester was over. <laughs> that, hence, you know, the way I started this thing. I had talked to a lot of people who were much closer to gun violence than I was. And so it wasn't a total loss. It's not that nothing happened. Um, I had run into resistance that I was really kind of surprised at and just not really pushback, but just some um, resistance of, you know, that's nice, but you're not gonna get any help from us sort of stuff. And I also understood that I did not yet understand who the stakeholders were. If I was going to do something, if I was going to come up with whatever it is, or that we were going to come up with whatever it was that we were going to come up with, who would we be dealing with? Would it be people like Mari, mothers whose, children's, whose children have been affected by gun violence? Would it be the shooters? Would it be people 20-something, kids in high school, kids younger than that? I didn't know. I didn't know who we needed to focus on to do the greatest good. And so the project ended. I was frankly overwhelmed by how much bigger this was than I thought it was going to be. I was embarrassed because nothing happened. And I literally, I, I sat on it for the summer. The fall came classes started going on. I was busy with other things. I ended up sitting on it with the fall and again in the spring. And then the, the one thing that I did do was talk to my chair and uh, got a course scheduled, a special topics course in human-centered design. And I was going to use this project as the uh, sort of the curriculum of that. Well, fall, spring, now it's summer. I've got to teach this class in the fall. And so I, I was pretty much um, on the books now to teach this again. So I did pick it up again. So this is a map of uh, the shots fired for 365 days. And I've taken screenshots of this map a number of times, and it always pretty much looks the same. <clears throat> but what I did with this this time was, I think, you know, one thing that shows us that Really, shots are fired, and the police are going on gunshot runs everywhere in the county, but there is clearly a concentration where these things happen. And even at this zoom resolution, there's an awful lot of red, but these these icons are overlapping each other. So if you zoomed in even tighter, you would you would start to see some some 
of the city map show through, but there would still be some clumps, but it's not quite as dense as what we're looking at right now. But I took this information and I took it into Photoshop and did some manipulating with uh, colors and came up and determined what I, these were the hot spots. These were the areas of the largest concentration of shots fired. Um, the center city, the TP Park area, the uh, Jimtown area, over into the Fulton Square was kind of another spot. And then there's a little small area down here on the uh, the lower southeast side. And really surprisingly, or not surprisingly, um, just north of Franklin Street here on the west side. But I, I had to sort of simplify things so I could deal with what was going on. But once I had this breakdown, I thought, um, Who can I talk to? I'm a preacher's kid, and I know that preachers have the best gossip. And so these little blue markers represent churches in, in the areas where, um, that are experiencing gun violence. The preachers would know. They would know who their parishioners are. They would know who is struggling. Um, and so that was the first thing I started to do this summer was calling them. Now, a lot of these churches are uh, bivoca bivocational pastors. So the pastor comes in on Sunday, preaches, the congregation comes in on Sunday and listens, and then everybody leaves. But I did talk to a few people with that, and uh, they were able to point me to different directions. Um, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Maybe, perhaps. They were able to, to uh, point me to, um, to people who could uh, um, help me out. I talked to two preachers in particular who were really, um, it was really good to talk to. They gave me some direction on, on what to do. One preacher in particular said, you just have to do the next thing. You may not know where this is going, but you just have to do the next thing. And so... I resigned myself to starting this class with four weeks of curriculum and then just seeing whatever would happen after that. But my four weeks of curriculum were made up of people that I had met and talked to in the community um, where you know one connection led to another connection led to another connection. And I ended up with a sort a short list of speakers that would come in and talk to my class. And after that, we would just kind of see what was going on. Now, the semester starts, we're jumping into human-centered design and the process is a three-step process. There's inspiration where you're really sort of getting inspired and learning about the process. And that's where you gain the empathy that you need to actually create um, create something, create something that would address, pose a solution to the problem at hand. And then that, that creation part is the ideation stage of this. So you have the inspiration that will lead to the ideation where you're making things, you're testing them, doing iteration after iteration, running it by the people of the community, seeing what will stick, what doesn't stick, making the changes that you need to, maybe throwing it out altogether and starting all over. And eventually, though, you will find something that will work. And then is the implementation stage. And that's the last stage of human centered design. That is actually taking this concept and making it happen, working out all the fundraising or the funding, the um, how you're how you're going to produce it, how you're going to implement it, delivery, all of that stuff happens in the implementation stage. It it's it's not a clear delineation, though, from one step to the next step to the next step. I felt like, though, by the end of the summer, after talking as much as I had talked on the second go around, that I was towards the end of the inspiration stage, getting ready to go into the ideation stage. I felt like I was finally at a point where I had the kind of em empathy that I needed uh, to do something with this within the TP Park neighborhood. My students weren't. Um, they were at the very beginning of the uh, inspiration stage. And so I, 
I brought the speakers in and uh, it, it, it was wonderful. I guess I should say at this point, I had no idea whether or not this class would work or not, um, whether the students would want to do this, whether they thought it would be an easy A or just something because they were locked out of all the other classes that they were supposed to take. Um, but I brought the speakers in and I asked the students to take notes, to write down questions they could ask at the end, and then um, we would write a little reflective piece on the end of that, and from those reflective pieces, come up with some uh, some worksheets that they would fill out and start the process of brainstorming and thinking of, of things based on what the speakers said. It worked so much better than I ever imagined. Um, the students were really into it, in part because the stories that my speakers were telling were so heart-wrenching. Um, and then some of you may have encountered some of this. I sent them out on campus. I split the class up into three little groups, and I made them go out and talk to people on campus, other students in campus. Of The question was simply, do you think that Evansville has a gun violence problem? And then just start getting some conversations going. But I wanted them at this point to talk and to engage with others and to practice that engagement with others. I, it's, it doesn't come natural. And I had one student in particular who's turned out to be uh, one of the most valuable students on this project said that you know her anxiety of doing that, of having to uh, socially interact with strangers was huge, but she did it. Um, and I think it had a a great return because of what she's been able to contribute to the project. So they went out, they gave out cookies if, if somebody would talk about um, gun violence or write down an idea. And we went through a bunch of post-it notes, cookies, donuts, and uh, some candy is what we we gave away. And they all talked to students and um, for two hours had a lot of interaction. Um, the speakers came, they, they wrote down their their reflective pieces. We spent about a week's worth of content with each speaker. And then I was afraid that they were beginning to think that this part of town where none of these kids are from, that they were beginning to think that this was um, really a dangerous, thug-infested um, hellhole. And so I didn't want them to go there. I wanted to sort of normalize this a little bit. So we took an unofficial field trip to Teepee Park during the day, of course. We weren't going down there at night. Um, during the day, it turned out to be the hottest day of the fall. And uh, the kids played on the playgrounds there in TP Park a little bit. We picked up a little bit of trash. We did a little walk around. Um, and then we got in the cars and we drove up. We drove north to the Jimtown area, right on Main Street, parked the cars in the church parking lot. And we did another little walk around the block in Jimtown. Interestingly enough, as, as I'm kind of like prepping this walk, um, they're noticing you know, the sidewalks are are cracked and broken and there's trash and overgrown stuff and one student is standing in the gutter and kicks a little piece of metal. It was a casing. It was a gun casing. So uh, that sort of, that bit of ironicness sort of went against my point of this, but still we're in the neighborhood during the day and it did sort of normalize that, that experience. And it was good. It was really good for the kids to see that this is a place where people live. People, kids grow up here. People live, go to school. They have to shop and, and do all that. It's not just a war zone. So we came back. And by now, the students had the empathy. And we, we entered the ideation stage. Um, here is something that I, I can show you guys. I, you know, part of the ideation stage, there was a lot of talking still before we actually started um, making things. And I think probably more talking than they were comfortable doing, but we went through a lot of stages with this. We came up with um, insights that they had not um, thought of before, insights that they learned from the whole process so far, maybe a dozen insights. We broke those down into 
five insights that we thought were this is new information that we could act on as college students, as an old white guy that we could actually start to implement. And with each of those five insights, and we were going to have a day of brainstorming, just throwing out ideas and see what would stick. And I challenged the students um, to come up with 100 ideas for each of these five insights and thinking, you know, maybe if I say 100, we'll get 50. After we went through all five insights, we came up with 500. Each one of these cards that are rubber banded together is an idea that the students threw out there, 500 of them totally, um, with all those insights over, really, it was a three-day session of brainstorming. From that, we did some what-ifs. What if we were to approach it this way? Um, we took those ideas, and the reasons why they're rubber-banded together like that, like this, is dropping them all over the place now, is, you know, we had to edit those. 500 ideas isn't practical, but we edited those. We threw some away because some, quite frankly, were stupid, but that's what brainstorming is. Even the stupid ideas will lead you to, to a valuable idea um, later on, or possibly it will start a new line of thought. We mashed them together. We edited some out. We um, condensed some of the ideas and came up with like 27 concepts that um, were viable, maybe 27. That's not bad at all. And from that, we, we went back and we, we wrote down our, we looked at our concepts and we identified seven design principles that we for sure wanted to stick with. It would sort of keep whatever creative that we would end up coming up with. You know, as long as we we're following these design principles, we would know that this was we were on the right track. And as we're talking through the concepts, um, the idea of uh, food deserts came up. That was something one of our presenters had talked about, which was a brand new concept to a number of the students. Um, we sort of discovered that there was sort of a library or a resource desert in these areas, in the, in the core of the areas where a lot of gun violence happens. And that sort of allowed one concept to rise to the top of everything that we had thought of. It, it is, uh, as one student called it, it's kind of like a library without the books, but it would be a, a way to bring technology research, resources, um, computers, uh, maybe some, some uh, tablets, free public Wi-Fi, uh, some a, a place for people to come and hang out, play some video games, maybe get some study help, some tutoring help. There could also be some organizations uh, using this. We could have maybe art workshops or or music workshops or or uh, job training workshops and a kitchen. Something that we thought was really important to this was to to tie this to home and to tie this to the neighborhood. It was really important that we always had fresh homemade cookies available on the counter for anybody who wanted to stop by. That's a concept that we have tentatively called Oasis right now. And I had class this morning before doing this. Well, yeah, this morning, Monday, Monday Wednesday, Friday class, yeah. They are, the students are currently in the process of putting together and editing an explainer video that we will be sharing this now with the TP Park Neighborhood Association Monday evening uh, to get the very first wave of feedback on this, um, which to me is really cool and really exciting that as lost as I felt at the end of the spring 2021 semester, I feel that much more excited that we have something right now. Now we're nowhere close yet. You know, there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done. Um, field work, whatever we come up with, uh, we need to be able to test it to run it by people to see if it's going to work. And in fact, I, I've applied for a couple other 
grants maybe for this summer to do just that. Um, and once we start testing, we may find out that our idea is stupid, but you know, we got 26 other concepts that we can try. And we'll keep plugging at this until we get something that shows that it will work and that the communities that we're dealing with embrace it as well. After that, then we can finally move on to the implementation stage. And this could be um, that, well, that, I have no idea what this could be, but we, somehow we're going to have to get some money, some funding, um, grants, possibly private sector. Uh, maybe USI can be involved with uh, um, supporting this in, in various ways. Community partners are already um, organizations at work in these communities, not necessarily addressing gun violence, but addressing other socioeconomic concerns that the neighborhoods have. They may be something that that we can partner with, however, how in, in whatever this concept turns out to be. But um, we have a concept. We didn't have a concept before this semester started. And I was so far from a concept at the end of the spring of uh, 2021 that I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm stupidly giddy right now. But I also know that whatever we do will not end gun violence. But I'm hoping that we can take that, that big map, all that red that you saw, and let some of the, the color of the background map show through. Maybe, maybe just in this one neighborhood, we can create kind of a little break or a, a circle in the middle of all the shots fired where um, people aren't shooting guns. Kids aren't getting shot at the front doors. Bullets aren't entering innocent people's houses and people are no longer scared to even go out on their front porch at night. And so that's what came from my Laura. It just didn't come in the right time or in that time. And it's still going to go. So that's what I've got. Thank you for your attention. And uh, wow, for as long as this took. Sorry. You're good. Well, thanks, Chuck. Does anyone have any questions? Here we go. Oh, someone asked, what was the code word? <laughs> Spatula. Spatula. If you know, you know. <laughs> it shouldn't be spatula because that's what I used in class, but it is. It's going to be spatula. All right. Are there any other questions? Was that in the chat? Can I see who asked that? Uh, it was in the Q&A. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I know Tepe Park, there, um, there's an organization here in town. I think it's called Community One, who's doing exactly. a lot of yeah. revitalization of the park. Have right. you worked with them at all or I done have. anything? I have talked with a, a guy named um, Austin Maxheimer. Mm -hmm. And uh, really... At, after we came up with this concept, um, he and I had coffee a week, week and a half ago. And uh, I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of consistency. Um, that will be somebody, that, that will be an organization that we definitely work with because they are doing the same kinds of things, not necessarily focusing on gun violence, but there's an, over, an awful lot of overlap between our concept and some of the stuff that they have to do. And already one of the things that they've done in TP Park has been to uh, revitalize or restore a house right at the front of the park that is a community center. That would be exactly the kind of structure where our concept would want to live. So yeah, yeah, I've, I've talked to him. He is actually gonna be at the, uh, the neighborhood meeting on Monday. So I'll talk to him again there. Um, cool. All right, we got a few more questions. So um, someone is asking, what are your plans for the next semesters? And how do you link these classes together? Well, I got to talk to my chair first because <laughs> I've got to go back to teach um, intro to graphic design in the spring. 
which it's good. I, I like intro to graphic design. I love teaching intro to graphic design, but this was a special topics class. And I can't, I can't do this all the time, you know, for, just for a number of reasons. And it, one, it would wear me out because it is a, a lot of energy goes into it. So it would be a number of semesters before I would ever be able to do this again, as it should be. And got other faculty who have things on their heart that they're passionate about that need to um, teach their classes as well. So how do I link this in is I, I don't see myself linking this in as a class so much anymore. Um, I, the people that I talk to to be on my team I still hope that I can get them involved now that there is a concept and now that there is is something that we can start putting together to test to um, help so that they can help me discern and decipher you know some of the feedback maybe help um, implement some of this if I were to get a grant this summer I could certainly hire a couple of students to help me do some little pop up events where we could um, try some of these things out in the neighborhood, show up on a Saturday morning and maybe have some art lessons and, and then ask some pointed questions, play a couple of games that were designed to give us a kind of feedback by using student workers for something like that. And then, and you know, this isn't something's going to be solved overnight. Maybe by the time we get to actually be being ready to finalize whatever this is, then maybe it's time for me to do a 399 special topics class again, and I can incorporate it that way. But um, besides student workers, it's pretty much, I think, going to have to be volunteers from within the community for the, the next couple of years. All right, thanks. The next question is uh, a statement and then a question. It was Caitlin Ebert who asked the uh, the code word. All right. And then also, <laughs> also, what made you choose design? Did you have a prior passion for art? Uh, I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> I, I was fired from everything else. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, I was always that guy that drew. I, I was, I, all, all of my high school electives, I, instead of getting out early in high school, I took art classes and yeah, um, I don't know. Um, I had a, a, a friend that had, well, yeah, he had three beautiful daughters. I dated two of them, but they were, uh, he was a watercolorist and worked at the the courier and he sort of took me under his wing and um helped uh, he did watercolor workshops it was just always drawing painting um was always what i did I, I went to college to do that until i ran into art history and i wasn't mature enough to understand it so i i was i knew i was going into advertising anyway and as advertising design it just sort of Everything else I tried to do, I failed at anyway. So that's where I, where I ended up. Don't tell my wife. All right. All right. Um, I have one more question. Then we're going to have to cut it short. Uh, not short, but end it because of the time. But it, uh, someone is asking, how do you encourage others to continue to pursue human-centered design? even with all the expected failures? Um, some, sometimes it's not worth it. Uh, yeah, depending on, on what it is you're doing, it always has a place. If you have the time to do it, in reality, a lot of um, lower level design kind of projects, you're not afforded that kind of time. Um, but, but certainly the bigger things, whether or not it's something for designed for good or designed for social justice, um, even if it is, uh, you know, app interfaces, human-centered design, that, that idea of testing back and forth is, provides you with way, way 
better information than you can get just coming up off, out of your own head. We live as designers, we live in a sort of a universe of one. We, we think we have an understanding of how everybody else processes information and how they'll process what we design. Human-centered design forces you out of that uni universe of one into um, the, the universe of everybody else and, and getting that sort of feedback. Even if it is, if you're not going through the, the entire IDEO uh, field book, but just taking a couple of exercises out of that and taking the design and putting it in front of somebody, watching how they interact with it and getting that feedback, that is invaluable information. Um, and the only way you can get that is by testing. Testing and then revising, testing and revising. So, you know, yeah, if, if the project will afford it for you, do it at, at some level. And if you don't know how to do it, IDEO will let you download their field guide for absolutely free. Professor Armstrong, thank you so much for this, this really interesting discussion. I don't know, I don't wanna speak for the other attendees, but I had no idea personally that design did anything like this. It seems closer to my field, which I, I, I love. Um, well, so, we should collaborate. Yeah, right? <laughs> And so thank you and everyone else for attending this this and participating in this discussion. I think it was it was interesting, right?